Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. I would like to introduce Gretchen Harwood from Digital River, who will introduce today's webinar. Thank you, Nelson. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today, How to Nurture Your Channel Partners and Succeed in the Digital Age. Uh, today's webinar is hosted by Digital River and features Forrester. We're glad you've joined us. The event is being recorded, and we will share this recording af with you after the event so you can view all the content on demand afterwards. During the presentations and throughout the entire duration of this event, all participants will be in listen-only mode. You can drag and expand the slide window to enlarge the view of the slides if you would like to. Um, also wanted you to know that we've reserved the last 15 to 20 minutes for a question and answer session for the presenters. So please submit your questions in the chat window, which is located just below your slides at any point during the event. Uh, the presenters will respond to the Q&A portion at the end of the web conference. Our speakers for today are Jay McBain, Principal Analyst for Forrester, who serves the B2B marketing professionals, and Mike French, who leads B2B product management for Digital River. Together, they have a collective 45 years of experience working on B2B partner channels and are experts in market insights for this area. So we're in great hands and going to have some really nice content um, shared today. I'd like to now turn the conference over to Jay McBain from Forrester. Go ahead, Jay. Um, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen, and um, I always love being introduced as combined experience, and as you move through your career, that number gets bigger and bigger and reminds you that, uh, that you're getting old, so that's, uh, that's great. Uh, but I'm really pleased to be here and, and, and talk about this, uh, this today. The channel is, is such a big part of the world economy. 75% of all world trade goes indirectly. You look in every industry, 27 different industries in every country of the world, and you just think in your personal life how much you do indirectly, you know, how much you buy at stores and how much you buy um, in, through agents and, and dealers and other types of things. And it's actually hard sometimes to think what you actually buy direct. So um, sometimes we don't um, think about how much actually goes indirect and, and what an important part of the uh, of the overall economy it is but one, a couple of big things are changing and a lot of forester research that we do is looking at how things are transacted how buyers behave and you know over the last 10 years you know i think everyone that's uh watching this webinar uh will observe that new line of business executives in the b2b world are making many more decisions in fact two-thirds of every technology decision today are made by these uh, buyers, and uh, they're more empowered than they ever have been in the past. They're spending more and more time in this mode. They're spending more of their own budget uh, in this mode, and uh, it's really changed things. And on top of that, there's demographic changes. Uh, so, you know, we're in a market where, you know, in four or five years, three quarters of all buyers will be millennials. And, you know, there's different behaviors there. And, um, and, you know, for different brands and, and for vendors and, and everyone in, in the supply chain, this becomes an important thing. It's, you know, it's traditional business models haven't really been built around these empowered buyers. And that's what we want to, you know, talk more about today. So, you know, to serve them, you know, this is not just a one selling mechanism anymore or this one-to-one -one marketing. You know, it's a whole ecosystem experience. And, uh, you know, customers of partners. And, you know, when we look at this, this partners might be influencers, they could be advocates, there's a bunch of different names for them. And, you know, several of these, what you would think are partners, uh, wouldn't even recognize themselves as that. So there is some uh, complicated and, and different permutations definitely to this. But, you know, when you look at the different types of channel partners and being able to attract and retain them, and, you know, we didn't have enough space here, but resellers, bars, MSPs, solution providers, you know, we could probably include six or seven other names here. Uh, depending on the industry by what they call themselves and, and what they go by. But, you know, the, the channel uh, is growing. 
in, in many cases, and the types of partners that, uh, that you'll have in the future are, are also growing in a, in a very big way. And, uh, you know, that's an interesting part of the research. But what, what's more interesting is only a third of them uh, report delivering a high-quality experience to customers. And so, you know, the channel is so important, as we've talked about, 75% of world trade. It's growing by orders of magnitude. However, it doesn't seem to be translating from the vendor, OEM, or brand to the customer that high-level experience that, that we all want to deliver. So it's a little bit of a conundrum, and it was great to, uh, you know, be able to dig in further um, with Digital River and, and do some research around this area. And we really took away three major things from, from the research. You know, number one is that, you know, channel partners, uh, their lives are difficult enough trying to follow different brands and, and vendors. And their loyalty has been waning in the, in the last number of years as their lives have become more complex. They're being asked to call on many more different types of customers, <clears throat> as we talked about the new empowered buyer, uh, they're being asked to do, you know, much more in terms of delivering the solution. It's, it's much more complex than it ever has been. And, um, you know, they're in a world where they're, you know, just trying to, you know, stay above water. And, you know, in that world, their loyalty is, is declining, which is, um, which is a significant concern because of the reliance that, that we do have on, on these partners. And, so we looked, uh, you know, further at this decline and, you know, tried to make a little bit of sense out of it. But, uh, you know, we're finding that, um, you know, this really presents a risk for vendors. And, you know, their level of influence in front of the buyer is actually growing. And we're at a spark, you know, if we're at a place where their influence is growing and their ability to deliver you know, the proper experience, high-level experience, is declining, uh, we're in a little bit of a conundrum uh, as, as an industry. So, you know, some of the numbers behind that, you know, partners will report that 78% of the cases, they are in the pole position. They're in the, the, the main seat in front of the customer controlling the experience. And, um, you know, they're not just a, uh, intermediary. They're not just a you know, someone that comes along during the buying journey and adds some value. But in many cases, they have that sole position. And when you compare that back to the vendor, which is only 58% of the cases, you know, has that chair. So, again, you know, this um, takeaway that loyalty is critical. And, you know, that number uh, needs to grow in terms of delivering high-end experiences, but also you know, turning around this trend, which is, um, you know, partners being less loyal uh, to the vendors. The second major takeaway was, uh, you know, the vendor tools and strategies are starting to distract versus enable. And, you know, we know through our research that there's 90 different parts of a channel program. It, it's not an easy thing to do to find and target new partners and recruit them and onboard them and train and certify them and then incent and motivate them and then uh, co-sell and co-market and then be able to manage that entire thing. So there's 90 unique components to that, uh, which is complicated. But that being said, um, the whole process of doing that and then the tools that, that uh, vendors use are meant to engage with partners, are meant to enable partners, you know, to be better in front of the customer, and in the end, drive the experience up. And just by the, you know, showing that 33% of, of good experiences uh, would say that that's just not happening. So we dug into this takeaway a little bit. And because channel partners are growing, sorry, working with a growing number of vendors, you know, each vendor has its own set of 90 things. So, you know, you are a partner and you're trying to make your money via services. Every minute that you're not billing and trying to figure out a vendor system it is, a, you know, a minute that you're not paying your mortgage or paying your employees. Uh, so it's critical for them. 
and they're in this world of permutations and combinations that many of them have just tuned out. You know, they just won't go to a portal. They won't participate. And they'll do the minimum possible to, you know, be able to sell in front of a customer, but, um, you know, not take advantage of, of any of the benefits that come with, uh, with being with that vendor. So, you know, looking at these tools further, and this is something that I've studied uh, for quite a while. Uh, I actually put together a channel tech stack that has over 100 companies that sell channel software broken into eight categories. And what's interesting is with all of these different companies and all of these different tools, what you find is that there are some pretty major gaps. And when you focus on the buyer and you focus on delivering consistent experiences, there are major gaps. And the software that you know, we have out there today just doesn't have that end-to-end -end capability of, of delivering and, and helping the partner, you know, make their lives easier and obviously drive a better customer experience is, is what we're trying to do. And then, you know, on the second part of that is incentives are really falling short. So, you know, we end up rewarding this short-term behavior. You know, most of us are on these, you know, weekly, monthly, quarterly goals, and you're always in this frame of thinking that, you know, I'm going to get fired next week unless I deliver this number. And, you know, human uh, behavior is that I will incent towards those weekly, monthly, quarterly goals. And I know in my heart that I ought to be really focusing on the long term and focusing on the customer, but I end up, you know, back to redoing spiffs and incentives and other things that are, are the deal of the day and deal of the week type of things to, to, to make me make my numbers. So there's always this internal conflict that we have that should I be doing what's right for the business and what's right for the long-term growth, or, you know, should I avoid getting fired next week? And this is always that interesting conundrum. And, you know, depending on the day or the hour, uh, which one wins. That, uh, that conflict. So the third takeaway was really, you know, to retain loyalty, you know, vendors must help partners be more agile and customer focused. So again, we talk about the partner who's got so many balls up in the air, is just trying to stay alive, got so many things going on. Um, you know, they're in a position that, um, uh, you know, they're struggling to participate as much as they should be in front of the buying journey. In some cases, they're not in front of the right buyer. They're not in front of the buyer early enough. And one of the pieces of research that we did was that 80% of these buyers don't think that these partners are specialized enough. So you've got this world where um, they're struggling and this new empowered buyer is, is someone that in many cases they don't know and or aren't adding enough value to and uh, are somewhat excluded from, you know, being in the conversation, being in the room while the, the, the customer makes, you know, decisions and gets influenced. Uh, or, you know, they're brought in later on for very much a commodity, low margin type of deliverable that really doesn't, um, you know, drive uh, enough profit and enough um, importance for that, uh, for that partner. So when, when we look at that, and, you know, if partners took a look at vendors, and, um, you know, it is a multifaceted approach to, to driving loyalty and to driving these integrated, sophisticated tools. So when I look at these tools, you know, things that are fully self-service, things that are mobile-enabled, things that are uh, very much focused on that partner, the, the personality, the persona, the profile, you know, getting away from the public library of millions of different data points and getting right to that partner, what they care about at that moment, and delivering, uh, you know, what they need in real time, is critical to driving more engagement and and getting partners, you know, to adopt more of these uh, these tools. Uh, you know, the final thing I think we've said it a couple of times now, it's really trying to get them to focus on the customer and building strategic and mutually beneficial, you know, vendor partner relationships. So if they do have some of the lead in front of, in, in front of customers, um, you know, in 78% of the cases, they've got to be able to build that relationship 
and what we'll show in a minute is that even those lines are blurring for customers, whether it's the vendor themselves, the vendor partner, in some cases those lines get blurry and uh, they're expecting that same high level of expectation, high level of delivery, and high level of experience, regardless of who's in the room and who's representing who. They're not keeping track. They just want to make sure that those two things are together. So when we look at the buyers again, they're giving preference to the businesses that deliver products at their convenience, at their moment of need, and again, they don't care whether it's you know, direct with a vendor or partner. There's an interesting piece of research around software that said that the buyers, especially millennials, prefer to buy direct. And that was 73% of them that reported that. And it wasn't for some other reason than they wanted the convenience and they wanted the speed and they wanted this ability to have that level of control. You know, they probably won't go and provision or install or implement or integrate that software. They definitely won't secure it or make it compliant or, you know, build out a business continuity plan. So downstream, I mean, they're not interested in a direct relationship for the sake of having a complete, you know, end-to-end -end project that they run. But they're definitely interested at the front end of having this closer relationship. So we're seeing, you know, a little bit of a movement away from reselling and those partners that are being really successful, number one, are, you know, spending more time with their vendors, but number two are really focusing on the downstream, which is the opportunity that comes beyond the sale and, you know, those integration, installation, and all those other services that I just mentioned, those are the things where the high-end margins are today and, you know, where vendors can do that well in, in terms of guide them there and enable them there, that's where not only the high-end margins, but a high degree of loyalty, you know, returns as well. So I wanted to kind of finish off by pointing to some of the research that we did. And I always love to look forward because, you know, it's interesting where things were a year or two ago and what got us to this point. But if you're building out a program, if you're trying to work better with your partners, if you're trying to drive loyalty, you know, it's always an interesting question is to, is to look forward to where the thinking is today. And, you know, first and foremost, we looked at um, uh, looking forward. So the question we asked was, you know, to what extent do you believe the following will describe the state of your vendor ecosystem in the next two to three years? So said another way, look to the future for you. 79% said that, you know, more vendors will move to recurring revenue and subscription models. So these are partners answering this, this question. And it's interesting that, you know, the world is going this way, uh, driven by the cloud, driven by the different infrastructure layers and business application layers. Um, they're seeing this movement and they're seeing the new empowered buyer and, and they're seeing this, um, you know, change that they have to um, uh, also implement in their businesses. Second to that is 75% of them are looking at the market dynamics and look at the vendor ecosystem. And it's definitely becoming more complex. So another piece of research that we did, we showed that there's 100,000 software vendors today, ISVs, where 10 years ago there was only 10,000. So I made a prediction that there's going to be a million in 10 years from now. And so when the average customer solution has seven different layers to it, uh, you're not in the world now of just working with, you know, one vendor or a couple of vendors. You know, many partners have moved from eight to ten vendors now to ten to twenty, and uh, you know they see a future where they might be working with fifty or a hundred vendors in a very specific solution, you know, in a sub-industry, in a geography, with a line of business buyer, sector, segment, size, technology stack, all of those things. There will be hyper-specialized vendors. And, you know, they will be looking for, um, you know, enablement from them, engagement, as well as, you know, ways to, to drive loyalty. So this world is getting more complex, not less. So third, you know, we looked at the, um, the lines that separate the roles that partners and vendors play. We, we mentioned this blurring of the lines, whether you have a certain 
vendor or brand in the room, or you have their representative. And, you know, I don't think customers care as much as they used to because they expect the same level and the same, you know, high quality experience regardless. And again, they have multiple people in the room and they want it to be seamless. And again, 67% of partners are, are definitely seeing this. And, you know, not only are they a representative of that brand, but they are the brand in, in front of the customer. And then finally, we asked, uh, you know, that, that same question. 62% feel that, uh, you know, changes in this customer buying behavior that we've talked about and their expectations will make it difficult to deliver this high quality and consistent customer experience. So they're dealing with a lot of, you know, nuances, you know, customers that are more empowered and more engaged than they ever have been. Customers that are spending way more time researching ahead of time than they ever have in the past. They're looking at, uh, you know, customers that may have different generational attributes. So this is not a webinar to talk about millennials versus Generation X versus baby boomers, but uh, everyone would recognize that there's different behavioral aspects to that as well, which, again, this is becoming more difficult not less uh, in terms of the partner's eyes. So when, when looking at incentives, you know, you've got to be able to, um, you know, focus on understanding rewarding customer-focused behaviors that obviously develop into revenue gains over time. So, you know, we talked about these short-term, you know, spiffs and bonuses and, and, and sales-related um, uh, you know, monetary or non-monetary plugs that, that are, that are short-term short focused. We're in the world now that, you know, everything is a long-term. I mean, in a recurring revenue model, which is 79% of the cases from the previous chart, we're in a world where you have to earn that customer's business every day, every month, every year. And, you know, the renewal-based business is this long-term strategy. And you've got to be able to incent You've got to be able to provide the tools. You've got to be able to provide the uh, enablement to that partner that is really geared towards this long-term customer-focused behaviors. And if that doesn't happen, you run the risk as a vendor or a brand that, um, uh, that you're not going to deliver the right customer behavior, and you run the risk that you're going to be replaced at some point on one of those renewals by someone who does. You know, my last slide is to say that, you know, over 75% of partners consider many of these tools. So configure price quote as an example, training, learning management systems, deal registration, business intelligence, mobile tools. I mean, there's many different categories that we watch, but they have to be effective at helping them sell software on behalf of vendors. Uh, it has to help them. Uh, it can't take time out of their day because, as I said, every minute they're not billing is a minute that they're not paying their mortgage. Uh, so these tools have to be, um, you know, driven, and they have to driven by self-service. They have to be very focused on that partner, and they have to help them along the way and motivate them to come back to the tools, you know, to even do their business better and not be seen as an encumbrance or a, you know, one of these once a week, I have to go in there and do my deal registration or I have to go in there and, and do this and this to check off some boxes so that, I, you know, the vendor pays me or they don't send me or cancel me from their program. It can't be viewed as a punishment. It's got to be viewed as something that, you know, you can use throughout the day and, you know, helps you sell more. And, um, you know, that's really where the uh, research is telling us that the world is going. So I'd love to bring back uh, Gretchen onto the call and um, introduce uh, Mike from Digital River to, to talk about some of these things in more detail. Thank you, Jay. Really interesting um, insights into the challenges that software companies are facing in today's market. I'm sure everything that you just spoke about is resonating with our audience members. Um, just a reminder, everyone, if you have questions for Jay, please submit them in the Q&A module, and um, he will be able to join us back at the end of the call to um, answer some questions you might have. I'm going to turn things over to Mike French now from the Digital River team. He's going to take us through um, really more the solutions to these challenges that Jay addressed and ways to empower your channel partners and deliver the right customer experience. Mike, go ahead. Thank you, Gretchen. 
Uh, and before we go further into any more detail, thinking about some of the topics uh, that Jay covered, the research, what we're learning when we talk to a couple hundred partners uh, from across the globe, serving different vendors in different industries from a software perspective, and talking about this move into the digital age, it's, it's really a question around disruption and how these changes to technology, how vendors deliver and service and sell and support their products through the channel to their end customers are representing a lot of challenges. They're putting a lot of stresses on partners. And as much as new capabilities like e-commerce and subscription billing systems are doing things to automate those processes, take some of the manual back office work out of them. Uh, at the same time, the role of the partner, the role of the channel in that sale, like, excuse me, Jay spoke through, in the ongoing service and support uh, is still critical. Just because vendors are finding ways to put these new technologies and capabilities in place to meet customer expectations, does not mean that the channel is going away or going anywhere. So it really becomes a question of, you know, how do we help our channels as vendors respond to these challenges so that we can continue to grow and succeed moving forward through this disruption? So. I talk a little bit about and coming right off of uh, from where Jay left off, um, you know, the partners in this research really indicated to us that a more sophisticated set of tools, and in particular, tools that help them work with commerce integrated delivery models for their end customers, uh, are really set to play a significant role in helping them to grow and succeed and respond to this disruption. So if we think about a couple points of data uh, that, that really brought this home for us, one of them really has to do with, you know, to what extent, you know, when we ask you partners, um, do you believe that the, the vendor ecosystem is going to change? What factors are going to drive that? Going a little bit of a level deeper, um, it's this response, almost 80% across the board, our partners telling us that, you know, we're going to favor vendors that help us respond to this disruption. If we have customers and customers that have a certain set of expectations, I am going to be inclined to work with a vendor that helps me meet those expectations. And the other item that really kind of popped out relative to disruption is this challenge around innovation. We all know that the market is now moving very quickly. And in particular, as we think about delivery of software through SaaS models, uh, delivery of software or digital services through uh, recurring subscription or recurring revenue models, uh, a lot of change is happening much more quickly uh, than it has in the past. And partners, you know, the overwhelming majority of them, find responding to this change, in addition to operating their business, servicing their existing customers, a, a real significant challenge. So if we think about that a little bit further, and we think about that need around digital commerce or commerce integrated tools, um, we ask some questions around customer expectations. And, you can see, again, this is to some extent a little bit of a drill down into some of the points that Jay covered. But this expectation around rapid fulfillment and delivery, the expectation, of course, around the digital experience. I don't know how many folks on the, on the phone, uh, the last time they had a buyer or as a buyer, they uh, shuffled around looking for a catalog to open up on their desk. It's just not the case anymore. The customers expect this a more convenient buying experience. Uh, they expect to be served across whatever channel they choose to interact with that vendor through. So that might be a partner, a reseller, a managed service provider. It might be the digital commerce storefront of the vendor. 
But you can see as we look across these, you know, 12 or 15 different categories, which of these items are related to digital commerce, and it's the overwhelming majority of them. And, and this is in part behind where we're seeing partners say we need this more sophisticated tool set that does more for us than simply take what was a back office practice and put it into a web-based application. We need to actually connect that process into purchasing, connect that process into fulfillment for the customer, connect that process into the ongoing recurring service and support that's provided or charged to the customer, and make it convenient and seamless for the customer. So when we continue to go down this path of looking at modernization and we think about subscription business models, now this is one of the items Jay talked about in terms of looking forward or into the future. And again, you know, nearly 80% of our respondents telling us you know, they believe this is going to continue to be a significant or the most significant trend moving forward. And many of you today, I'm sure, are involved in subscription business models and may be asking, you know, how do I make this work with my partners? It's a challenge already just for us. How do I get subscriptions to work when I have to push subscriptions out through a thousand partners that I have or the renewals that I need to go chase from my end customers? Well, interestingly, you know, as we look at it, about 40% of the partners we spoke with said they already have 30% or more of their revenue from recurring revenue models, subscription, billing, et cetera. And that is going to increase. My prediction here would be that in another couple years' time, we're going to see this number double. We're going to see 80% of partners having more than half of their revenue coming through subscription or recurring models. The challenge here this represents when we ask partners, well, how do you service that revenue? How do you service these customers? And what are the challenges that you run into when you're going about implementing and managing this kind of model? Now, again, think about it. We have partners who are working with, on average, 10 to 20 different vendors, each of those 10 to 20 different vendors that they may be representing have a subscription model in place, and that partner may be, on behalf of those different vendors, working with an end customer for whom they need to manage or support that end customer through a dozen different subscriptions. And it's a new model for partners to take on. You think about things like you do today as a vendor with designing and implementing a retention strategy? How do you handle for things like the billing or payment information that's associated with a subscription? Uh, any of you running a subscription model today will know that one of the biggest challenges to getting a successful renewal rate is what we talk about being involuntary churn, meaning that that end customer, they didn't have an intent to end their subscription, but the billing information that they provided either expired or is no longer valid. So the capabilities to be able to chase, track, understand when something like a credit card is going to expire and take actions based on that to assure a higher level of successful renewal rates is a real challenge. That's something that vendors are struggling with. It's not something that partners of the channel themselves have the competency to be able to chase down, understand, and optimize on behalf of their vendors. Uh, we can see some other items like simply the fact that they lack expertise around this model. They lack the tools to implement against this model. And another thing that I, I almost always call out when we talk about working with partners in a subscription or recurring revenue model is accessing and understanding what actions the customer is taking or needs to take relative to that service or subscription. A great example here is simply an end customer trying to reach out to a vendor 
to get their subscription renewed or to add additional devices or seats for folks who are covered or need coverage by that subscription or service. The partner needs the ability to understand what transaction is happening. When we think about fulfillment, we're not just thinking about fulfillment of a product or service. We're also, and we need to think about, fulfillment of the end customer information, both the data about the end customer themselves as well as what actions that end customer is taking with their subscription. The fulfillment of that data to the channel partner is as critical to the channel partner as the fulfillment of the product itself to the end customer. And the next thing and one of the key things that, that we asked uh, partners was not just to think about end customers themselves, but also what capabilities they need. And this is where we drill a little bit deeper into some of the specific features or functions, so to speak, that a partner is looking for in their tools. So today, many of you, if your partners are still purchasing you know, offline or they're purchasing by contacting your customer service department and sending a purchase order that you're taking and turning into a sales order in your ERP system, um, that purchasing process at this point is effectively outdated, especially for your channel partners who are frequent purchasers from you and kind of your super users, some of your most important customers. They expect a streamlined purchasing process, as well as the ability to offer their end customers a streamlined purchasing process. I already spoke to you know, the concept around the importance of end customer information, capturing it and sharing it. You see items here around marketing tools. How, if we have a partner involved in marketing or referring, are we connecting them and closing that loop to end customers? Reporting tools and information, subscription and entitlement management tools, uh, and another key point around incentives and discounts, rebates, um, all of these things when we think about our channel, as, as Jay was describing in the past, have really been focused on how do we drive a certain short-term behavior. I'm a vendor. I have a target for this quarter. I really want to get this many sales in or this many orders through, so I'm going to put some kind of incentive in place to drive my partners to do that. Well, when we start to open that up and say, okay, now e-commerce is also a purchasing channel, where my subscription and billing platform is also a channel through which this revenue is coming, how do I attach that to a partner? How do I know if an end customer is coming in and doing a renewal that I should incentivize a partner for it? And more importantly, as we think about the ongoing need to retain that customer over the course or life of that subscription or service, what are we doing to incentivize and reward the partner for the service and support the activities they're doing to retain that end customer on your tool or on your offering on your behalf? The key thing, I think, if you take a step back and look at this slide other than the individual line items, is really to kind of just look at it in a whole. All of these items relate to capabilities around digital commerce and how we leverage digital commerce integrated tools to enable our channel. And all of these items have an overwhelming majority of our respondents telling us that they are either extremely important or very important. This is the area from a tool and enablement perspective where if you are not able to respond as a vendor to these needs, you are going to suffer in terms of channel and partner loyalty. So a couple key points uh, from a Digital River perspective, and um, I always think about it as taking what I hear from our clients or you know, prospects that we talk to or when we're out in the market uh, talking to other folks at trade shows, Everything that, that I hear from vendors as it relates to their channel and going online with business-to-business -business commerce, I, I think can, can kind of break down or be summarized into, into these four statements. Right? Everybody I talk to says, 
well, I really want to explore doing this. I really want to explore getting this online. I know my customers want it, um, but I'm also really concerned about conflict. How can I go and do this without blowing up my channel or blowing up this reliable revenue stream that I'm already counting on, that I already have in my financial forecast for the year? I don't know where to start. The complexity of B2B ordering. When people think about online, you know, they usually think about, hey, I'm a consumer, I go to Amazon, or I've got a shopping cart, uh, I just drop an item in there, a price is a price is a price, I purchase it, I'm the buyer, I end up being the entitlement holder of the software I've purchased, uh, I'm the contact person, right? In B2B, that's all different. The person who's buying is not the entitlement holder. The person who is a contact for uh, maybe performing additional subscription or provisioning operations is not the buyer or the entitlement holder. We have different challenges like pricing, quoting, purchasing approvals. The point we've already made around sales incentives and compensation being a challenge. So it's really critically important as you think about putting tools in place that are going to help you enable partners to respond to this disruption, that those tools have a capability to help you manage incentives. Otherwise, where you'll end up is needing to staff an army of people with their faces in spreadsheets to try to keep track of and calculate this stuff. And most of the existing incentive compensation systems that are out there are not really well suited for some of the new business models and revenue models that are in place. There are some, and it may be that you've already implemented one at your company that you can use and apply to solve this problem. In most cases, uh, we haven't found that statement to be true. And then finally, of course, uh, as we've talked about already, service contracts, subscriptions, uh, they can absolutely require an extraordinary amount of work to coordinate the entitlements, compensate partners, manage renewals, or what have you. So um, just one more slide to give you a little bit of a, a picture of how Digital River approaches solving this problem. Uh, those of you who are familiar with us may know um, we have and have had for 20 years a really comprehensive suite of capabilities that solve some of the harder blocking and tackling problems when you think about commerce. Order management across borders and across the globe, handling for those challenges around payments, managing things like fraud, tax compliance. How do you take what commerce is doing and plug that in from a financial management standpoint? And how do you solve problems like accountability for seller of record or merchant services and dealing with, excuse me, dealing with credit card companies, dealing with clearinghouse payments. So there are a lot of challenges that can come into play that Digital River over the course of the last couple decades has really focused a lot on solving. And what we do from a business to business perspective is simply take a set of capabilities that are purpose built to deal with the challenges in business to business and layer them on top of that platform that we have matured over the course of the last 20 years. We talk about things like the ability to integrate to multiple systems, very important in a B2B environment, handle for complex trading patterns where you might have resellers organized under distributors who have end customers organized under them, supporting different incentive models and automating that incentive compensation into the actual transaction workflow and commerce activity, handling for the complexity of those workflows, the billing and subscription model, and one item that always comes into play from a B2B commerce perspective is the challenge around the complexities of business pricing. So this is how we go about solving the problem and bringing to, uh, bringing to the market a set of capabilities that allow our customers allow our clients to determine and specify and build out specifically what they need to solve this challenge for their business end customers and for their channel partners. And that is uh, it for me. I'll hand it back over to Gretchen.
And thank you very much, everybody. Mike, fantastic. Thank you so much, um, both to you and Jay, uh, just sharing your expertise on this topic and these key insights. Very, very interesting information. Um, we have received some questions from the audience while you guys have been presenting, so I think we should now just address some of the questions from the audience. Um, the the first one um, that, that that came in, um, I'll read the question and then turn it over to um, either Jay or Mike to answer. Um, a reseller channel has historically driven the largest portion of sales revenue for most software brands. Is this still the case in the post-digital dis digital disruption age over the past few years and the rise of direct-to-consumer e-commerce e channels, or has the model changed? Will it remain a primary channel in the future? Um, Jay, would you mind responding to this one? Yeah, absolutely, and we do quite a bit of research in this area. And what's interesting is, you know, a lot of the surveys that come back, you know, say that 73% of these new empowered buyers want to buy direct. And, uh, you know, that's concerning, and, you know, we ask ourselves, is this the end of resell? And then, you know, after we start asking ourselves that, does it really matter? You know, in the, in the new um, software cloud recurring revenue world, you know, whether it's, um, you know, the monthly fees and, and whatever that structure is, the richer revenue, and it's almost four times the revenue, comes after the sale. And I, I mentioned earlier, you know, integrating, installing, complying, securing, uh, continuity, all those type things are driving 75% margins today. And for those partners that are focusing on the downstream, and not really spending time, you know, billing, collecting money and things like, you know, like that, you know, they're finding that there is a place to play in that world without actually getting the resale. We're also seeing that no one owns a customer anymore. You know, the days where you own a customer and you own every decision they make and everything goes through you as a virtual uh, decision maker are gone. Now that, you know, there's 10 line of business executives you know, surrounding themselves with five people each, there's probably 50 people influencing decisions within, you know, your customers today. So it's less about ownership and it's more about, you know, participating and adding value and building that ecosystem that we talked about. And whether it's, you know, the, uh, whether the transaction flows through a partner or not, I think to the customers, our research is telling us that that maybe is less important, but, you know, overall, I, I could see it, uh, you know, at least being a 50-50 split longer term uh, in terms of, you know, those customers that want to do single billing or, or consolidation and, and or have it managed uh, their cloud environment and along with their on-premises environments, you know, in one central place. So it, it'll definitely be a big portion. I just don't think it'll be the majority portion that it's been, you know, in decades gone by. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. Uh, next question, has the impact of subscriptions and recurring bill billing models been a good or bad thing for channel partners? Uh, Mike, you started to touch on this in your presentation, uh, probably a good one for you. Yeah, great. Um, this is a great question. It's one that I actually get a lot. And um, I answer it by saying, well, it is, if we take a step back away from good or bad, it is a change that is inevitable and it makes partners nervous, right? So if we start just by touching on that, we know this is the direction everything is going. We know partners know the direction this is going. Why does it make channels nervous? Well, it, it makes them nervous because um, the, the utility of the tools and how subscriptions are being delivered today kind of puts some of them, depending on the type of resellers that they are, or the type of channel partners that they are, in a position that the value they're bringing to the table is really weakened. Um, if it's a product or if it's a capability that does not require much ongoing intervention from a channel partner, uh, as Jay was kind of indicating in, the, in his response to the last question, then you know, they feel a little bit nervous or afraid that they could be disintermediated uh, by this move to a subscription or recurring billing model. The other reason that they have a concern is that for many of these companies that compose our channels, uh, cash flow is an important part of how their business works. And many of them for a long time have been in a model where up front they sell, you know, a fairly high dollar piece of software to an end customer. They receive that revenue from that large sale, 
And now they're using that income and cash to operate their business. And now with the subscription model, we're taking that large upfront purchase and we're turning it into a fee that gets paid in 12 or 24 installments over the course of a year or two years. That is one of the challenges that, that has partners or has partners feeling nervous about this shift to subscription. In terms of it being a good or bad thing, it's a bad thing for partners who aren't ready to evolve. And there is a certain demographic of our older channels who simply are to some extent intransigent, and they're not willing or have the capabilities to make this move or make this transition. And that's just part of the, the evolution that a market's going to go through in any disruption. But for those partners who are choosing to evolve, uh, this can be a very good thing. Not only can it represent, once that financial shift is made, a much more of an annuity recurring revenue stream that they can count on, not just for the sale they need to make happen in this quarter, but revenue they know will be coming in over the course of the next year. It can also, with the right tools and technologies, make it possible for partners to keep up with a larger volume of lower value end customers who they would otherwise simply not be able to chase. So if you can help them by putting tools in place that allow them to see the benefit of automation in dealing with things like recurring revenue or subscription renewal rates, it can be a very good thing for them. So the question really comes down to what kind of channel do you have and where is that channel on the curve in terms of evolving? Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Um, we have another question from the audience. This one I think would be a great one for Jay to answer just in terms of his view from an industry perspective. It's where do companies typically fall short in terms of their technology ecosystem? What are the greatest system limitations and how does this impact the sales process and revenue? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it kind of falls into three categories, the answer. You know, one is I mentioned there's 90 different components to running an average channel program and there's over 100 companies. So what's ended up happening is, is companies have plugged in, you know, disparate systems and lost a little bit of the flow. Um, so it feels like as a partner, you know, you may go to a portal, and then once you start clicking around, you know, you're, you might be in 10 different places, and they don't talk to each other, and it, it just seems uh, like it's um, inconsistent, you know, in, in terms of the flow. You know, the second thing is companies, uh, especially large companies, are um, guilty of adding people into process. And, you know, as you go along the workflow and the business logic of running a channel from one step to the next, you know, every time you put a person in between one of those steps and you put an approval or, or something else, you slow things down and, you know, it's prone to human error and things. So. You know, systems that aren't automated, systems that don't run, you know, end-to-end -end and, and things like that uh, can, can very much be um, falling short in, in terms of delivering what you need to. And then, you know, what we talked about today is probably the most important. You know, it's really helping partners become more customer-focused, and we even talked about long-term, you know, customer-focused. You've got to really enable them to do what they're best at and not – you know, focus on the day-to-day -day blocking and tackling and, and other things that might help you as a vendor, uh, you're really focusing on the customer, which in the end, you focus on the customer, you drive more revenue, you drive more profit. It benefits the partner, it benefits you, and, um, you know, you've got a system that's really set up well for the future. Great. Thanks, Jay. Um, those, that concludes the, the questions that have been submitted to right now. If there's anything further, people you know, can please submit them in the Q&A window. Otherwise, you'll see on your screen right now contact information. Please reach out um, if with further questions and to connect with us. Um, just want to thank Jay and the Forrester team for their research, um, their work on the research and joining the Digital River team today. Um, as a reminder, everyone listening is going to receive a free copy of the research paper that details everything that was covered today and goes into more detail. Um, and just so that everyone's aware, you know, 
that you know that Digital River, you know, we are an industry leader in creating these e-commerce experiences and multi-channel strategies. So again, reach out to us directly via phone, email, or connect on LinkedIn and Twitter. Look forward to speaking with you about your businesses. And that concludes our webinar today. Thank you, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our live webcast, How to Nurture Your Channel Partners and Succeed in the Digital Age. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your phone line and log off the web portal.